Happy Friday. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Hey, what's going on, Jeff? Cheers to everybody. Oh, you can't see my beer. Oh, there it is. That's my <laughs> green screen thing. Well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, I can turn this. You know, everybody can do this. You can, uh, you can actually go into the little camera and go into video settings. And, or I'm so, yeah, go into the little arrow and you can do choose virtual background uh, and then you can pick a picture for your background. Here's the, here's the nun. Here's where I really am. Oh, okay. See that now I'm like, now you can see my hands and everything. Well, if I did it the other way, I could hide my beer from my wife. That's true. I can even do, I can even do a fun video. Let's do a video. Let's see. Choose virtual background. Um, Look at that. Oh. Wow. Is that your, uh, yes, your property in the squim, right? Yep. That's okay. Lavender Meadows. Awesome. Here's a little bit more of a depressing photo. <laughs> yeah. And more of the same. A lot of planes on the ground. Mm -hmm. That is the site of $54 billion bailout. Oh, sweet. It's just passed. Oh, Wendy and Jeff, you guys are muted here. Let me unmute you guys. There you go. If you guys want to talk anyway. Yeah. If, if you, if you get out of line though, we can mute you quickly. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> no, I, uh, I think, I don't know what the, what the expected turnout on this guy is going to be, but it looked like there were quite a few people that were um, going to hop in. What's up, Timmy? What's up, Ryan? Hey, how you doing? Good. Oh, two Ryans, two Ryan G's. <laughs> I know it's complicated. He That's gonna be confusing. It, was it your Was it your assistant that accidentally sent me that email the other day? Uh, marketing person, I think. Hey, Corey, how are you? I'm good, Ryan. So, I don't know. We were gonna try to game plan a little bit beforehand, but oh shit, people are just gonna start bouncing. Um, I shouldn't say shit. Damn it. <laughs> um, <laughs> God dang it. um but i was gonna maybe go into a little bit of, of kind of just some of the stuff that we've already started seeing some of the stuff i've run into on on deals and sellers already um and then maybe uh kind of roll into ryan if you wanted to go into uh what you're doing different in your business and kind of what you're doing for your investors and that kind of thing too sure um, but uh, and then the, the Zoom, does Zoom pretty much let you download the file later and you just clip it or inside of Zoom or do you do it like... Oh, so you want to record it? Yeah, probably just because then you can put it on online or pop it on the... Oh, website. you know what? It's already recording. So we're good. Yeah, we're uh, we're live. Oh, perfect. Okay, recording started. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're good. I'll try to watch my language. <laughs> yeah, behave. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hey, even... even is there and he's probably hiding from his kids um <laughs> <laughs> well uh, i'm i'm ryan garrison i think i know almost all of you um i'm i'm an agent investor down in olympia um i'm with exp realty and uh basically we usually run a, a happy hour meetup down here um pretty much people hanging out in a bar and having beer and just talking about real estate stuff and uh, with the current uh, environment now, everything is virtual. So uh, it's virtual yeah, beer. Yeah, we have to turn into a drinking game. Um, every yeah. time someone mentions uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus, you have to chug a beer. There you go. I'm sorry. Um, so here's here's kind of where uh, what I've been running into lately is I've, I have a property I was going to sell uh, on the market and we had several offers, uh, offers over asking. Um, the first one kind of kind of fell apart just because of uh, seller financing and appraisal. We put it back on the market the day that the NBA canceled its its season um, is when the when the house went back on the market. And I was worried, and then I got an offer. It was really good, even better than the first offer. Um, but the next day, the lady had a panic attack because she had to lay off all of her employees and then pulled out of the deal. Wow! And so um, I've I've since actually pulled that house off the market. And I figured I was going to let the 30 days like go before I, I relisted it in or find a renter in the meantime, renter or lease option person. Um, and so I want to start the days on market over when it goes back on the market rather than have it in this whole limbo period. 
my, my personal uh, worry is more about deals closing than offers because I know there's people out there and there's still demand for properties. I'm just a little concerned with the lending, the lending platform, like what's going on right now. And, uh, you know, I don't know uh, other agents or me, I see you there. Uh, he's me with certain lending. Um, Tim, what other agents are running into with, with what they see? Well, they just pulled the down payment assistance program. So anybody getting that FHA um, bond is no longer. So I've lost two buyers through that. Yeah. Oh, geez. Um, and Erez, do you have Are we still collecting days on market right now? I was, yeah. I, I had heard something that we were not. I heard you can do a pause. Um, we wanted to, but I don't think they've done it yet. Yeah. They've talked about it. I just am blown away that cannabis is an essential service and we're not. That's bullshit. I think people need to smoke weed right now. <laughs> I think people need to sell their houses right now. <laughs> That's what I think. I think I got three properties that I would offload to free up some cash right now. Oh, God. Um, one, one thing I can tell you that I have definitely already seen and I'm super excited about is um, sellers that I've been dealing with for off-market properties um, are much more open to discussing terms, um, whether it's seller financing or subject to, or even lease option. And so I am, uh, my, my eyes are getting huge because I really want to add to my personal portfolio and specifically with seller financing. Um, I just don't like stuff on my credit and the way things have been, banks don't like to give me stuff on my credit with my income not being on paper. So it's kind of, I'm kind of excited about that, but it's, it's spooky right now for sure. For a lot of folks. Um, you know, I, Ryan, what, what does all this stuff mean to you? I mean, I'm, for those of you guys who don't know, Ryan, uh, you might've saw the little bio. Uh, he, he's the CIO at Spartan investing and um, he is uh, doing, well, I, I've put money to work with you and one of your syndication projects on a, on a multi or on a, a storage facility in Texas. Um, you also are doing a new, a new mobile home park, I think in swim. Um, yep. so if you want to maybe briefly tell people what you're doing and then, uh, kind of how, what's going on affects you. Yeah. So we actually just, uh, <clears throat> had the whole team brief today. And, uh, one thing that we did was we are just doing kind of like a SWOT analysis of the current operating environment, mm -hmm. uh, because things are changing, you know, pretty rapidly across all of our, um, kind of business, our businesses, property management of our own properties, uh, construction, capital projects, and then acquisitions, obviously, and capital raising. So I guess it's kind of four things in one. Um, so we're just making adjustments. Uh, storage is still an essential business. Uh, so we're still open. Um, on our cash flowing storage projects, we're actually seeing an increase in occupancy and our delinquencies have not changed at all. In fact, our delinquency rate are hovering below our business plan targets. So we're seeing also a, a, an uptick in responses from off-market letter campaigns. They're up about 20%. Um, so we see, um, you know, more buyers too. There you go, Ryan. I love it. Yeah, you like that? Was, yeah, there you go. I, I thought it would let me preview. Damn it. it no, as soon as you click that picture, you're done. <laughs> I can see Augie's in the bathroom right now. <laughs> I just messed with him. Um, anyway, so the, yeah, the, um, uh, the lending environment is interesting. Some life codes are still lending. Um, hey, Augie. Uh, you know, the conventional banks are still, some of them are still playing ball. Uh, we don't really go after any hard money, so I, I can't really speak to that. Uh, but one thing I've noticed is, you know, some of the, coupon clipping, cash flowing, occupied storage businesses haven't really seen a hit and are going to be harder to come by, um, I think, with COVID because it's kind of a safe place to put your money. And we've um, obviously on the capital raising side, we're adjusting strategy and going virtual. So virtual meetups, virtual happy hours, virtual property tours, uh, you know, doing more webinars, uh, doing more engagements, you know, um, you know, we're going to do a virtual happy hour actually pretty soon. I like it knee in the galaxy. Um, but, you know, that's really kind of the biggest thing is just kind of making sure we have force, force majeure in all of our contracts. And we've included coronavirus now in our PPMs for raising capital, um, just kind of a, that as a risk. Um, but, uh, yeah, just kind of, kind of overall what we're doing. 
sorry, I'm not like uh, prepared with the presentation or anything, but um, that's sort of, uh, you know, kind of how we're looking at this across the portfolio is that we really haven't seen much of a hit. Um, on the RV park side of things, we're very heavily exposed to oil. Um, Trump has uh, started buying up oil uh, from U.S. companies to fill up the strategic reserve, and that's given us kind of a bump uh, in occupancy. Uh, but we're overall down uh, in occupancy in that regard, but we're still cash flowing because they're not, not very levered. Um, but, uh, you know, oil futures, I mean, we're going to see, you know, crude continuing to get a beating, especially with nobody driving or traveling anywhere right now. So, um, personally, I think, uh, you know, I know that we're all getting hit, you know, personally and everybody's kind of experience varies, but, you know, one thing that I've kind of out of the bill that passed today, um, you know, the airlines are getting a $54 billion bailout. So I can kind of speak to, you know, kind of people that I know in the airline industry. So, they're guaranteeing that nobody gets laid off until September 30th. Those same people are going to get not only a guaranteed job until September 30th because the airlines cannot lay off, but they're also going to get a check in the mail from the government. So I think there's winners and losers in this. And I think people that are continuing to get a paycheck will not only continue to get that paycheck potentially because of the top level bailouts of corporations, but they'll also get another bump in the mail, uh, from the government in addition to that. So, but then there's also people that, you know, might be hit twice where, you know, their businesses are struggling and they don't meet the AGI requirements of getting that check in the mail. So they lose their business and they lose their, and they don't get a check. Um, so those people are going to get hit. So just because the government's pumping all this money into the, into the uh, economy, I think, I think you're going to have people that all of a sudden go, yeah, I, I didn't lose my job and I got this nice check for me and my family and, uh, you know, no changes. And in fact, now I got more money in my pocket from this. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting dynamic predicting where that's going to go. Um, obviously, you know, we saw a 3.23 million unemployment rate, uh, today, um, go up and, uh, you know, that's the, like four times larger than the biggest unemployment increase ever. So, it's anybody's guess <laughs> what's yeah, going to happen. So absolutely. I came from the, uh, from the car business, the auto industry. And so I was checking in with some of the people that I know still doing that. And, you know, they were told specifically like, Hey, you know, we've, the, the owner's been talking to the lawyer that everybody is getting, you know, temporarily laid off kind of thing and, and go file for unemployment. And that's just, you know, kind of what the deal is. I think that was on the sales side. I think service might still be essential. Um, just cause I think people might need to get their cars worked on occasionally, but I'm not 100% certain. I don't know. I mean, Augie and, and Nee, I would love to hear from you guys as far as from a lender's perspective. Um, nee works with certain lending uh, and does hard-ish loans. Is that the maybe the best way to, to, to put it? You're you know, uh, investor, long-term uh, rental loans too, and you can maybe tell that. And, and Augie, I, I know you're on the conventional side. I don't really know uh, much outside of that. Yeah. Oh. There you go. Uh, oh, you're, are you talking, but I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah, you're, you're cutting in. Yeah. Nope. nope. Okay. <laughs> I, guess, I guess we'll hear from me. <laughs> hold on, let me, let me unmute my, Augie. Okay, hold on. Okay. Let's see if it, let's see if I, try it now. Nope. Uh, I, you might need to change your uh, mic settings. Yeah. Uh, Aren't you a millennial, Augie? Put your, put your gamer headset on or something. Come on. <laughs> okay, I, I can speak a little bit while Augie uh, figures things out. Um, so, I, I mean, so certain lending, we didn't know we were, were a nas nationwide, but also local lender here. Um, and we did bridge loans as well as long-term 30-year um, loans for one or four units. Everything is not, we're not a bank, right? And so we stopped lending last Monday. Uh, and we were one of the first lenders to just put, put a pause on lending. And I was, and I can tell you before, before we were direct lending, we were also a broker. So we still have relationships with other lenders. Uh, and and I, I've been, the last couple of weeks, I've just been calling around, talking to different lenders and seeing what the, what they're doing. And this is all on the hard money um, asset base side, right? And so I can tell you that as the week went on, um, more lenders start pulling out, right? And they're still doing that today. I mean, I saw some news today where lending says, oh, a lender, uh, I can tell you who lender was Lima One, right? Lima One last week said, 
we're still in doing loans, guys. We're going to be at 65% loan to cost and 50% ARV on our bridge loans, which is a huge, huge change because they were one of the only, they were one of the biggest national lenders that did 90% loan to cost, even for brand new investors, right? And they changed their policy to 65% loan to cost and 50% ARV uh, within, within a week, right? And today I got an email saying we're no longer doing our rental loans. And I can tell you, I, I, I can't imagine any, any lender that does, that's not a bank doing a 30 year rental loan right now. Um, because every one of those guys basically has to resell in the secondary market and they're not buying right now, right? Um, a lot of lenders, I mean, most lenders that you see that has cheap money, they are, they are reselling their loans. Um, and right now they're, they can't, right? So they're either stuck with on their balance sheet or they have to figure out some way. So a lot of lenders right now, they're in survival mode. They may have laid off some folks, I can tell you, I, I mean, I wouldn't share this publicly, but this is like 12 people. It's, it's <laughs> um, not recorded at all either. Okay. And then, well, I guess it is. <laughs> you can see the little dot in the corner. Um, I mean, so, I mean, I can tell you, so we, we were hiring candidates. I mean, right now we put a pause on hand, but we were hiring and um, I, I, I learned about, you know, like Loftium. I don't know if you guys know Loftium. Um, but what they do, but they're, they're basically a, a startup where they, they give you a long-term lease and then they put an Airbnb tenant in there. Um, right. Run that for you, right? And um, as of last Monday, I mean, last Monday, they let off over 90% of their employees, right? Obviously the Airbnb market has been hit pretty bad. Um, a lot of companies are going out of business. A lot of companies have been doing startups and in real estate and the lending, biz, the lending uh, companies, I think they're just trying to survive at this point. Um, and so, I think an overall thing you can say about the asset-based lending is that right now the only consistent lenders that I think you can depend on to close are the local ones and who are charging 12%, right? Hmm. Cheap money is, is no longer there. I mean, and Civic has raised their rates by 2% already, both on the rental and, and um, bridge side, right? Their cheapest rate right now is nine and a half. Um, so every lender right now, they're either, they've, which one was that? Who'd you say was nine and a half? Civic, but but that's at, at very very much lower leverage. I, I spoke with Rain City today, and they tightened up everything. They got rid of their, yep. their Magnolia program for exactly. now. Exactly. So that last week, they every single day they said they were still lending, and then the terms changed as the days went on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they kept saying we're still doing this, we're doing this, and then because we had we were sending some loans their way as well, because I want we wanted to be taken care of, right? But every single day the terms kept changing. And then as of as of yesterday, they told me no more no more cheap capital, you know, no more um, Magnolia Arm. We only have twelve percent money right now, mm -hmm. right. and that's primarily because they're going to have to carry it on their books because there's no secondary market to buy their products, so they have a finite resource of cash to spend. Yeah. How much? You now we have. I mean, multiple different markets that we're talking about here. I mean, on the one side, we're talking about. Uh, redevelopment of single family homes, bringing garbage back into breathing it back to life and putting it back on market. And then with Ryan, he's doing more commercial where you've got a lot of players in that business that are on zero M mortgages that were just pumping cash flow, but have no equity in their properties. And I think that that, that a lot of that world is going to get turned upside down if this goes on for too long. Um, I would love to hear from, from you guys where, you think the opportunities really are. I mean, I've got, I've got one of my buddies right now who he and I spoke last night, very well funded. We are looking for deals, whether it be um, apartment buildings that need to get rescued out, but also the, the one thing I think all of us are struggling with this is what are the asset prices going to adjust to? And a lot of that is a moving target because we don't know how long this is going to last. I mean, what Ryan was talking about, look, we own two small businesses and they will be lucky to see the light of day again. And it's not just because of our business being impacted directly by customers and which ones aren't going to make it through. Like one of our customers just made placed a, a paid a $40,000 invoice, right? I read an article uh, last week that, you know, she had written in, she was published in the local newspaper. She just laid off about 600 employees. And if she doesn't get help, she's not going to make it through. And if she goes bankrupt, the bankruptcy court has a 90 day look back period. So that could actually have a, a contagion effect where it impacts 
my company, you know, that's going to be happening all across the board. So there's a domino effect here that nobody's talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and I actually, um, I don't know how it would affect you because you're doing stuff internationally. I was um, just talking to someone a little bit ago and, and uh, they, they kind of tipped me off on the, uh, on the SBA disaster loan stuff, which you probably already looked at, um, which I think. We're looking at next week because yeah. now with everything being yeah. solidified today, we're looking at it next week. And I don't know, and maybe someone else has a better answer than me on that, but like for, for me, I'm, everything's like, yeah, there's, self-employed there's llc's there's entities but as far as like an actual like business there's not there's not that and so i don't know i'm, I'm probably kind of out of luck on that stuff but it's worth at least trying or seeing but so, I don't know to talk to. so uh, yeah i don't know who to talk to either but i don't know what changed between last night and what was approved today mm -hmm. but apparently it was covered from february to end of june um it includes sole prop independent contractors and self-employed. The maximum amount was your average total monthly payments for payroll costs incurred during the one year period before the date to which the loan is made times 2.5. And then, um, Wait, say that one the, more time, Ryan. So this was, in, this was what is in the bill. I don't know what actually made it through, but this is what was in there last night in the 88 page bill on it. So it and included, you're talking, and you're talking specifically about what they're what they're talking about. Where if you keep your employees on for 90 days afterwards without reducing your workforce more than I think it's 20 percent, then the loan actually turns into a grant after three months, right? Something like I don't know about the grant part, but yeah, it can be forgiven from what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. So it okay. includes Sorry. basically it includes everybody here because you know if you have a business, you have a, you're a sole prop, but then it de it depends on what your average monthly payments were to payroll during the year before. Uh, the lender considerations are borrower operating as of February 15th, 2020, and had employees that were paid salaries and paid payroll taxes. So if you're not paying payroll taxes, then you're out of luck. Um, there were non-recourse loans with bad boy uh, carve-outs. Uh, interest rates couldn't go above 4%. Payment deferral, not less than six months and not more than a year. Loan forgiveness uh, covered period is the eight week period beginning from the date of the origination of the covered loan and then covered rent, uh, rent lease enforced prior to uh, 215. So if you had anything before that, it doesn't count. Expected forgiveness amount, payroll costs, payments of interest on mortgage, payment on rent and covered utility payments. And then the limits of the amount of forgiveness uh, reduction based on the reduction in number of employees during that time. So it really depends. They didn't say 20% or 80% or anything like that specifically. Um, but it sounds like that might be what's available. So. Yeah. So no payroll means you're screwed by that, by the way that reads, that would be, mm -hmm. uh, that'd be tough. But why, why, you, why are you laughing, Augie? You, your microphone still doesn't. Oh, you still. <laughs> you can write us though. You can yeah, write join the internet Augie. audio. <laughs> Augie, you should call in. You should call in. Yeah, Augie, you should down and down instead. Here, let me, uh, let me. Forward Augie needs to call. drink a beer, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You can't talk until you drink a beer, anyway. Up oh, there, we go. <laughs> All right, we're good. Hold on, Augie. I'm gonna send you the whole thing. It's short changed. Uh. Yeah, Ryan, that the the rent is really interesting in in our situation because we have an SBA loan on our building in one LLC then the companies rent the building from that LLC. So I think that qualifies. Maybe you get paid. Yeah, I don't know. Week. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was one of the, thank God we did this, uh, you know, at the turn of the year, we have 25 employees. And what we did was we rolled up all of our subsidiary LLCs, uh, all the employees into our operating company, Spartan Investment Group. And then we put all of our ownership interests into a, holding company. So right. all of our employee payroll is run through Spartan, even at the subsidiary LLCs. So our storage properties, they're all Spartan employees. And okay. we did that for ease of payroll and economies of scale. And then we did that for liability protection because if one of these employees sues us, 
they can sue Spartan Investment Group, but they can't sue our holding company and take our assets or our ownership interest. A similar um, structure, yeah. Another benefit to that is right now where they, you know, the, the, the bigger the loan I can get is based on the bigger my payroll is. So my payroll is very big at the one entity because I have all the employees rolled up into it. Right. So I didn't know that that was going to happen, but <laughs> apparently it's an advantage now. Wow. That, yeah. that, that worked out okay. That worked out good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you dial in yet, Augie? I see a phone. Oh, there it is. I'm going to have to unmute it, though. Oh. I'm going to unmute him. Yeah. That's there me. we go. That's we got Augie. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. Well, all the stuff that you wanted to say but couldn't, you can now. <clears throat> okay. Well, I was just going to give you guys a, a little bit of an update on – hold on. Let me turn this off because it's not an echo. Um, I was just going to give you guys a little bit of an update on the conventional mortgage side. So – I don't know if you guys have looked at any of the MBS activity that we've seen in the market over the last couple of weeks. Augie, but talk a little slower. <laughs> okay. Just, um, a, just a little. And closer. Sweet. So <clears throat> what I was saying and is smile. I don't know if you guys And smile. Have... You got to smile. <laughs> Only smiles. I'm a mortgage guy, so it's, uh, it's, this economy is great for me. So... <clears throat> Basically, I don't know if you guys have seen the um, mortgage uh, MBS market over the last couple of weeks or if you guys even look at that sort of thing. But basically, uh, the way I understand it is, you know, us in the mortgage industry, kind of like as a collective, is we went out between roughly March 1st through March 9th-ish and originated enough demand to kind of uh, fill the entire supply uh, for MBS uh, appetite on the secondary market that would have existed for six months. We did that in about like two weeks. And so what we saw, the um, rates kind of shoot up. We saw at one point I took a screenshot of it. BECU had increased their rates all the way to six and a quarter percent, effectively just shutting down the market to any new customers. Um since then, the uh, Fed stepped in that Sunday, and this is, uh, I believe, the 15th or 14th, I forget, and said, hey, we'll buy, you know, $700 billion of, of bonds, $200 billion of which will be mortgage-backed securities. And the market opened up that Monday. Um, briefly, for about a couple hours, rates were okay, and then they shot up into the 4% again. Uh, we've just seen some incredible shifts in pricing to where conventional lenders are, you know, doing maybe four or five rate sheets a day um, with, you know, quarter to half point swings on rate. Um, but it is, it is, the market is open for everybody who's like buying or selling homes. So single family homes, um, particularly in our Seattle market are flying off the shelf. Uh, we're seeing um, plenty of appetite for uh, the Fed to continue to buy mortgage backed securities. Um, so they're going to keep the, they're going to keep the single family primary residence market very open. However, what we've seen is there's no yield in uh, mortgage lending right now. So for people who are doing like cash out refinance on investment property, uh, two to four unit properties, um, there's really just, there's no, there's no mortgage you would do. Uh, the cost, the cost to do so would be inhibitive to actually pull the cash. And so in essence, the banks are kind of shutting anything down that's not that primary residence or, you know, single family um, business. But yeah, so now it just are, become are open. It just became difficult to sell a two, three or four flex. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're going to have I'm, I'm, I'm believing you guys are going to see a lot of uh, uh, pro, uh, seller concessions being requested um, just to kind of give you an idea. I don't know how familiar you guys are with conventional lending, but um, basically what adjusts the interest rate on a loan is called a loan level price adjustment. So if you think about that, let's say that you all are buying a primary residence with 20% down payment and the interest rate for that is 3.5% with no points. Um, then you change that scenario to say, hey, it's a single family home investment property. 
there's a loan level price adjustment for that. So that same rate is still available to you as a, uh, as a buyer. However, it's going to have two, point discount, uh, two points of discount, making it more expensive. What the lender typically would do in that case is raise the rate to cover that cost. And that's why people believe investment properties have a higher rate than a primary purchase. The problem is in order to have that work where you raise the rate to cover that cost, you need to yield. And what we've seen is once you go above the par rate, there's just simply no yield on the board. So with multifamily, let's say you were doing a fourplex uh, investment property, um, that might be as high as, you know, four points of adjustments, depending on how much you're putting down. So, you know, even if you're putting down 25% uh, investment property fourplex, like you, you basically have to pay three points of discount. Huh. Augie, can you do me yes. a favor? This is one of the games that I play with um, my clients. You know, I was, you know, back when, when, when rates are 4%, the difference between a four or five and a 6% rate, um, you take that down um, <laughs> th because your income didn't change, right? So you have X number of thousands of dollars a month to spend on your loan. And when you go from four to five or five to 6%, you reduce that final price of what you can borrow by eight and a half or so percent each time that you do that. Um, that's what your monthly payment buys you. So can you translate that to, I don't know, what are we, what are we seeing on fourplexes now in the area? Five, six hundred thousand so, dollars, seven. So, so this is, this is, uh, this is the issue I'm talking about is <clears throat> the rates actually aren't bad. So the rates are, you're not, a, you're not able to adjust the rate high enough to cover any of the cost. So you're still going to get one of the best interest rates in history, regardless of whether you're getting a, a, a single family home, primary residence, or a, a fourplex investment property. The only difference is that the yield being paid by the bank is only enough to pay the bank. So if I want to give you guys a deal where I'm only going to make 1%, let's say for my, for my business, that's already all the yield. So what we're seeing is even, even primary residence consumers, like if you want to get a three and a quarter percent today, we'll absolutely give you a three and a quarter percent, but you know, you're probably going to have to pay a 1% discount. And then there's really, I mean, you'd have to go so high on interest rate to try to cover that 1% discount where it simply doesn't make sense. So like How high? the buying power, the like, like uh, three quarters of a percent maybe. So like not even not even worth the conversation, and then the problem is with the investment property example I gave you is that there's such a high spread that it, 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 the best way to explain it to somebody is there is no higher rate. Like you are just going to be paying if you want to buy a investment fourplex in this market, you're going to be paying points, and you're going to get a fantastic rate in like you know the uh, you know. Uh, low four percent, or even in the three percent, you're just going to have to pay, you know, two three points minimum to get it. And so, what we're advising our investment clients is, if you are buying an investment property that has lots of loan level price adjustments, is that you're going to need to ask that seller to cover a portion of that, uh, which they'll probably be, you know, in a couple months here, they'll probably be glad to uh, kind of give you whatever you want, um, you know, if you're the only buyer in town. What do you think, uh, what, what would you say to someone who was looking for a refi but kind of missed that, that dip? Um, are you, are you yeah. thinking to hold off for a month or two or what are you thinking to do? So, so this is what's crazy, guys. So like the people who are left in mortgage are, are typically pretty good because it's actually a really difficult business to kind of grapple. And then if you're not good, you don't make money. So like, you know, the average person who steps in might make like three grand a month and that's not enough and justify the pain of doing mortgages. So what we did, and I mentioned earlier, is we originated like so much business. Like I, so I originated 50% of the business I did last year in one week. Wow. And I'm not the only, I'm not the, I'm not the only person. That's every single person at my company, every single person at Caliber, every single person at uh, Fairway Home Lending, every person at Bank of America, Wells Fargo, et cetera. Like everybody 
did quadruple, if not more, of their business in one week. So we're still actively, like we have a team in uh, India that does a lot of our processing and uh, remedial tasks. They're working at night while we work here 24 seven on loans just to clear the existing pipeline. We've, we've finally seen uh, it start affecting the regular market. Uh, you know, people never believe us because they're like, hey, I just had an appraisal in a week and hey, I just got my title quickly, it's no big deal. But over the last three days, we've started seeing appraisals tick up to be at least two weeks typically, if not longer. Um, and then some title companies like First American are taking over a week just to get a title policy back. Um, but, you know, we didn't stop when rates dipped or when, when, when rates shot up, we didn't stop. So all of us have hundreds of applications just sitting and, uh, you know, all we're doing is updating the clients who didn't get that lock on kind of what's happening in the market. And, uh, you know, we're saying, we're saying to new prospects, if you don't submit your application today and simply, you know, even if the terms are 4%, no one's going to take a 4%. We get that. But if you don't get in, we all have so many loans to lock that we will sell out the entire supply of low rates probably in one day if we can even lock all our loans that quick. So we're, we're telling clients, get in, get in line, let's set a, a target savings and a target cost, and then when that locking opportunity comes, we're going to get you locked in ASAP because it's not going to exist again. And uh, we do see the market uh, providing more yield uh, this week. Uh, starting last Friday, uh, rates came down a little bit. Um, this week, they've been pretty consistently uh, at a place where we've been locking some people in at three and a quarter to three and a half percent on a 30 year fix for primary, uh, depending on the day. Um, today, this afternoon, after they passed the stimulus, rates did trickle down a little bit. I believe over the next week to two weeks, we'll probably see a little bit more uh, easing on interest rates. But uh, in order to see more easing on interest rates in the conventional market, they have to really figure out um, how, how the whole mortgage industry is going to work. Uh, what I mean by that is when your mortgage is, is sold, so when I lock your rate, so let's say I'm going I'm to lock Ryan Gibson. So I lock Ryan Gibson's rate at 3.5%. That mortgage is instantly uh, uh, hedged with an end user buyer who agrees to buy Ryan's loan at that price for a given number of days. So let me close Ryan's loan, right? And it goes and it's serviced by a servicer who gets paid a premium uh, or gets paid a portion of the interest rate to service the loan. And then the investor takes the rest. These servicers, typically how their business works is uh, they were going to, um, only make money if the person's loan is serviced for between three to five years. So somewhere right around that four year mark. The problem is when interest rates drop from, you know, 4% for like, you know, three year, two or three years to, you know, I don't know, I got some locks at like 2.875% or whatever is we just hammered the servicers. So the servicers are, are running around like, dude, we can't make money. Like you just literally like stripped us of all the money we have huge losses. We can't even come buy loans, right? And then on top of that, they have a new thing they have to deal with. If they don't get paid for, uh, so these servicers, they have to pay the investor. So let's say uh, uh, the UK invested pension bonds in mortgage-backed securities. The servicer has to pay the investor, the bondholder, regardless if they get paid on the mortgage. So the new problem that they have is, you know, prior to, prior to COVID, there was a big enough pool of people that it was relatively low risk. They wanted to get paid. And if they didn't get paid, they could foreclose and get over it. But now they can't foreclose. And technically, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac has said, you don't have to pay your mortgage payment for 12 months. So the servicers are like, holy shit, like, we don't, we don't want to give people money. We don't want to encourage like crazy loans to get done right now because we have to price in the risk of, you know, 20% unemployment here and, and losing payments for a year. So they're working with the Federal Reserve uh, kind of on the same thing that the small businesses are doing with the stimulus to get loans from the federal government to kind of uh, help pay these bondholder, uh, uh, you know, interest 
um, payments, even while people are not paying their mortgage payment over the next 12 months. So until they kind of figure out how they're going to work with the Fed on that, I don't think we're going to see rates push down under 3% again anytime in the next, you know, 30 days. But I do believe that we will see very, very, very low interest rates probably over the next six to 12 months. Well, I was, that was like drinking through a fire hose. That was, that was, (laughs) (laughs) it's it's, it's too much. And like, I, dude, I, I know a lot about it, but I, I had to, I just don't even like mortgages. I'm like done. Like, I'm just like, guys, just sit in line. You deal with it. Just trust what I say. I'll lock you in the minute. It's good. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you're locking in a rate and you have to be able to sell it to somebody. And that market is just very all over the place. Peaks and valleys. Yeah. You know, interest rates are going up. And then the Fed just injects all this money and makes all these commitments to buy these mortgages. Interest rates go back down. I mean, and that's why, that's what we've seen. It's like nobody will even lock a rate because they don't know where to price it. So, or they just price it at a much higher rate because they just know that it'll stay within that range. I mean, that's essentially what's happening. So it sounds like it's just a big traffic jam. That's correct. So what we've seen is we've seen a call from a lot of the big mortgage guys to basically say, hey, uh, current administration and, and nation and everybody, I know you want your rate to be good, but y'all can, you know, piss off for now. We can't even close all the loans we have is kind of what they're saying. And, you know, what we've even seen here is uh, certain banks have basically just even said, look, The reality is we have so much business. We don't even want to take your application because one, everything's getting figured out. And then two, we have so much business. Like what's, what's the point? Like we're all going to make so much money. It's disgusting. Why, why would we even take your loan that we don't even know if we can close right now? So, you know, I saw that with Umpqua uh, recently, you know, I reached out. I was like, hey, guys, I got $2 million to put down on a property. Like, I'd love to rock and roll. I got a history as a landlord, all that. They're like, are you seriously even asking for money? And I was like, dude, yeah, I'm a fall buyer. And they're like, nah, we are so busy that, you know, you can call us back in 45 days. I was like, really? Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's it basically we, we were too efficient. We originated way too many loans. It's crazy. And I think that I think that over the next 30 days, a lot of that will be out of the pipeline. So for instance, just over the last two days, I think I've closed something like $5 million of of mortgage loans, just like maybe every hour a set of docs and a closing disclosure goes out. Like it's just, it's, it's insane. Um, And, you know, even, even people who were not good loan officers are just closing ungodly amounts of business. So that should clear out because uh, you know, the, the market is much, has much better technology today and people are using outsourcing. So that should close out over the next 30 days. And once it's closed out, you know what we're all going to say because we're greedy bankers is, hey, give us those good rates again. Let's, let's rock and roll. We'll sell you whatever you want, government. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know. Like, that's, that's, that's just so much to fathom. Like, I just can't imagine doing that much business. Like, how, how, much, how much are you working like a day? I mean, so like, dude, I came back, I, I spent like 30 days in Maui, like an idiot. And, uh, this, this started happening and I came back and I was like, Oh man, our hits are getting kind of good. I should start gearing up for some refis. So I, I kind of got some things in place and then, uh, rates hit like three and a quarter. Like, Holy shit. It's a refi boom. This is the, that was like three and a quarter was like the lowest rate really kind of during the 2019 financial crisis. And so I was like, I'm going to make, I told my wife, I texted my wife. I was like, Hey baby, I know that I told you I wasn't going to work a lot, but I'm just going to tell you right now, I have an opportunity over the next 30 days to make enough money to retire. And she's like, you can have 30 days. And I spent 16, 16 hours a day for three days, simply putting applications into a system, clicking a lock and telling people not to call me. I was like, I'll, I'll call you when I'm done locking and did that for about three or four days and then started trying to solicit a little bit of business. 
And it, it was the first time in history we didn't even have to do anything. All I did is I went to, I went to five people, five, you know, people who I know are, you know, influential with their groups. And I was like, hey, Ryan, I just got to tell you right now, there is a wave coming to the mortgage industry that I have never seen before. I'm going to do this for you. Anyone that has a 600 grand loan, you know, because I don't want to do the small shit. The small shit can wait. I'm like 600 grand loan. I'm going to get them dialed in. I'm going to get the best deal they've ever seen in their life. And it probably will be the best deal ever in their life. But they have to fill out their application today and then not ask me any questions for like a week. And then they went out, got all their buddies in, poured in, and then all those people wanted their family members. And then I did the entire Albert Lee sales floor. And then I did everybody else, right? So like everybody just called it. I didn't even send out any marketing. The first marketing I, 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 I went out to do um, was the day rates shot up. And, uh, you know, I called the entire city of – marketing so efficient right now. I called and texted the entire city of Bothell for anybody who had a 450 to 650 grand mortgage. And we got, like, texts and calls back like crazy. And I just didn't even respond to them because I'm like, dude, there's nothing we can do. Rates are 6% now. Um, so, I mean, it, the, the amount of work – uh, over the last, you know, couple weeks has been insane, but now, I mean, it's like whatever. We're 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 reaping our harvest, and we're looking at what the Fed's doing. I mean, dumping two trillion dollars into stimulus, making sure people stay on payroll, which means we can still refinance them, and uh, buying up all the bonds, pretty much buying unlimited bonds. I think what do they buy fifty billion dollars of bonds a day or something silly? So. Uh, I see really good things in the mortgage industry. It's a good sphere to be in. And I do see, uh, just like during the last financial collapse, <clears throat> you know, we're going to see some pretty crazy mortgage uh, programs roll out over the next six to 12 months after they see the real impact that this has had on the economy. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone on this call put it the best way. I won't call them out just in case they don't want it shared, but they said, you know, buying a house today um, would be like looking at the price of Boeing stock at 120, knowing it's going to be there, and then going back in time four weeks and buying a ton of Boeing at 330. And uh, I think that that phenomenon is going to happen because when you look at the unemployment, you know, the whole industry of buying is predicated on the ability to repay. There's not going to be buyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. Um, I know that from from the other side of it like i've i want to see that continue and i want to be able to to take advantage of it if i get the opportunity but i've seen the other side too where i talked to an agent today that they literally had five deals blow up in the last week right and yeah. and so that's that so i'm actually i just uploaded 1200 agents contact info into my crm to do a a drip campaign to to agents and basically staying top of mind for the buyers that maybe or the sellers that um, might need to get out of their loan in some way or another or get or just be able to walk away from it and are willing to let someone come in and take over payments or that kind of thing. Um, so if you're an agent, I apologize, you're probably going to get an email. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the other side of it. And I'm, I'm, hoping that maybe a lot of people are able to take advantage and there's still the lending programs there, but how many banks go away? How many non Fannie Freddie backed loans or, um, you know, are, are just not, not lending and how many deals have blown up already. Um, so I, I would like to see, you know, more, um, more just consistency. Cause how do you, how do you run your business when tomorrow, you know, four banks go away or now they need double the down payment? Um, and so I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you see, I did need, did they put a timeline on your, on your stuff or what have you seen from the other lenders as far as, are they looking at it in 30 days, 60 days? What's their, their kind of goal right now? No one's giving a timeline. Everyone's just basically saying we're waiting to see how the markets turn out. Okay. So here's, here's the thing that, you know, and I think Augie is referring to me who, why would you buy a house today when you know it's going to be a certain price in the future? Um, so you have no lending going on. Well, you have lending going on, like Augie's been talking about it, an incredible amount, but you have all these hard money lenders taking their foot off the gas. Why would you buy a house right now? Why would you go into this market? It's foolish. 
you, you don't think the market, the real estate, the, the stock market is going to impact real estate. You're dead wrong. Mm -hmm. It will eventually come after it. So if people are like, Oh my God, Oh my God, I can't get a hard money loan right now. Maybe you should understand the, the second and third order effects of that. This whole market is propped up by one thing, debt. You pull debt, you don't have a market, <laughs> right? Period. So if you cannot get a hard money loan, you are going to take the wind out of the sails of all the investors that are doing flips and putting the houses on the market. If you can just be patient and wait four to six weeks and then go look at the market, I think you're going to see a much different story. And some people might say, well, you know, I want, I, I'm not afraid. I want to keep going. Right. And that's, you know, that's a risk that you're willing to take, but your upside in doing that is going to be far significantly lower than your downside of waiting. And if your downside is greater than your upside, don't do the deal or don't do deals at this current point in time. So I'm not in the residential space, but I know that, that you know, when I was in the residential space, flipping houses, you know, I knew that it was, you know, the, the crash of 2008 was because we did not have loans. And when the banks stopped lending, that's when you had the credit bubble and you had nobody transacting in real estate and you had a huge drop in values. And so I think the pauses that you're seeing from very smart, hard money lending companies like Veristone and Rainy Day and, and, and all, the, all these other companies, they're basically betting on problems and it might be because they can't lend on their balance sheets, which, you know, makes sense, right? They're not selling those notes out to anybody else. They're lending on their own balance sheets. They're essentially using their own pocketbooks, but that's going to have an impact on pricing. So if you're holding a property and you really need that draw or you need a loan or you just bought something and you don't have your hard money set up yet, you know, um, that's one thing. But if you're deciding to buy a flip right now, I would think twice about it. That's just my opinion. Well, Brian, what, what do you think is the adjustment? Because I mean, with, with I, I agree completely with everything that you said, you can't press, you, you can't make a decision based on the sales price of two weeks ago. If you're buying anything today, you can still buy, but there's going to be a discount there on whatever it is that you're buying because you're taking on that risk and you don't know where this goes. And part of that is we don't know how long this goes on for. The longer it goes on for, the worse that it is, the bigger the descent is, the bigger the fall, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, so I mean, no, I was just going to say that yeah, what I'm also seeing too with this is, uh, you know, people haven't gone to the auctions or a lot of people have stayed away from foreclosure auctions for a while just because it's been hard to get a deal. And now you have certain lenders that, uh, that have been, all over it, buying for their clients and everything, and, and they're not maybe originating right now. So that's another another avenue too that, you know, there's less lenders available, but there's going to be less less people even at the foreclosure auctions, which we haven't been able to buy in a while. There, just a couple of clarifications, guys. It's there are lenders right now. They're just expensive lenders, right? So all the local lenders that are twelve percent, they're still in business, uh, and they're probably making more money now than ever, right? Now, not not all the lower cost lenders out of town. Um, I, I believe the foreclosure auctions are also halted at this point because, because of the shutdown, but also because there's no foreclosures for, for a while. I didn't hear, oh, um, yeah, I didn't hear that. And then, all right. Yeah. Oh, I want to, I want to quantify it if we can. I want everybody's opinion. If I've got a $500,000 flip that last week, uh, would have been able to get two weeks or whatever it was, could have gotten, uh, 1.7%. And yeah, that was my, my ARV is seven hundred fifty thousand dollars going into it. How do you think that purchase price is affected today? How much of a price cut should we put into that today? We can still buy. There's got to be opportunity in this market. The question is where and how big of a haircut do you need to give the seller in order to mitigate your risk? I mean, I'm just going to say this. If you have anything that's close to being finished, put it on the market today because there is a market. I'm not sure in six months. I mean, that unemployment data, I don't know if you guys saw the chart that I posted or the Yahoo chart for unemployment claims. It was 
if you if you were around in 2019 and saw the drop uh, of real estate and ability to get funding, et cetera, you know, you, you kind of knew what that felt like. And in 2009, you, you couldn't even sell a house. Like the average deal was like, you know, I put a house in the market for 700 grand, client would offer 650, client would do uh, inspection and, and ask for another 50K off and they'd end up getting, you know, this million dollar house for 500 grand or, or 600 grand after negotiating it. And so, you know, I think what you have to do is not focus on what you think the market will be this summer or where you think it will be. I think you have to focus on how long you might have to hold it because a lot of people who are flipping property right now are flipping with razor thin margins. Um, right. And, and realistically, I think that uh, if your, if your exit timeline is six months from now to 12 months, you're really going to want to look at options for, can I keep this as a rental? And even if uh, that is a negative cash flow position, uh, you know, what's the cost of that cash flow position to get me to sell in 24, 36 months? Uh, because you also got to remember 2008 uh, when the market hit, you know, or the, you know, peak drop in values um, or 2009, it was 27% in, in Seattle, the prime areas of Seattle. And it took until 2014 to really be back to break even. So that's, a, that's like a five, six year gap. And so if, if the switch finally flips, which I believe it will flip, uh, you know, like if you could sell today, put it on the market, stuff selling, it's hot, it's crazy. I don't know why people are buying, it's nuts. But when that switch flips, I don't think you, I don't think you're going to be able to sell in six to 12 months if it flips. Like there's not going to be 20, 25 to 30% of buyers were investors. Investors are not buying if they can't get hard money loans, nor are they buying if they can't make money. Um, the other 70% of buyers are, you know, 20% of them are going to lose their job. So how are they going to buy home? There's the chart. I mean, that just shows it right there. Like it's crazy. Uh, I mean, you look at, you look at 2009 there where they're circling, uh, you know, at the left, look like at the 2.66. But, but in 2008, in, in the last crisis, we had an oversupply issue. Now I'm talking low clap, not talking, you're talking that. Locally, we still have air We have more demand. You're cutting out, Eris. We're going to get you. And then we can start. In, in, 2000, in the last financial crisis, we had an oversupply issue. We don't have that today. No, but you have, you have, you have two parts of the equation. You have supply and demand, right? Yeah. Unemployment right. directly affects your demand, and so does the ability to get loans. Correct. Right. If, if, so let, 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 let me just put it this way. So peak unemployment, if you look at the graph back in 2009, peak unemployment was 10%. Uh, the Great Depression was 25%. They're projecting 20% unemployment. That means best case scenario, unemployed is going to be financial collapse. Worst case, unemployment is going to be Great Depression. And the very first unemployment numbers we got hit the absolute highest projected unemployment anyone saw. And my guess is by the end of April, that's probably going to double. Um, if we lose all if we lose all the investors who are propping up our market, which is about 25 to 30%, that leaves 70%. If 70% of those people are regular people and they're going to lose 20% of their jobs, that's going to cut us down to only 56% of the people who are actually buying homes right now are going to be able to buy them. That's going to drastically reduce demand. And that doesn't count the people who are freaked out and not going to buy. So Augie, you're saying we're going into a depression not a recession uh it, it's possible um i think that you've never not ever seen words in your mouth. I mean, yeah well what i'm what i'm saying specifically is i think that this is going to be the wildest the reason why i'm smiling is this is going to be the wildest thing that any of us have ever seen and uh the reason why i'm taking solace and not super concerned about it because if you actually think mathematically about what's happening it's literally so big and so crazy 
that it's the first time in history everyone's going to have to get bailed out and work together to actually make it through. I mean, the biggest uh, mobile home park uh, owner in the world, aside from Ryan Gibson, is Mr. Buffett. And, uh, you know, he doesn't have enough billions to support all the payments that the people put making, let alone Berkshire Hathaway, which owns thousands of businesses that are probably struggling like crazy right now. Nobody's safe. Everybody's screwed. So in that, in that situation, you look at them throw, you know, what, $700 billion one week and then just drop $2.2 trillion the next week. Like, sure. They also say, hey, they know it's going to be so bad. They say, hey, you know what? People haven't even lost their jobs yet, really. You don't have to make a mortgage payment for a year. Like, that's a crazy intervention, right? So, they, let they, me ask you they, a they question. You can't, they can't, yeah, good if, point. In, in, so, so, okay. We've, we've got a lot of properties, a lot of it's money tied up in properties right now. And you're telling me right now that the secondary market is shit. You can't buy anything. You can't go get a loan there. But single family residential, primary buyer, yep. you can you can lend on that. Now, if I've got somebody that's in a position where they're being, you know, maybe partially funded by the government right now because of all the layoffs right around, can you work with those people right now? No. So I think that I think that there will be I think there will be loan programs coming out, and this is kind of what I talked about. Like for residential lenders, I think we're going to have a big boon. Um, is so many people are going to be laid off because of this uh, coronavirus, and I think it's going to be. I mean, obviously the steps America is taking are pretty crappy for extending it. So I mean, it's going to be a pretty long boon. And I think the government's going to, you know, you look at Canada is going to pay 75% of people's payroll, you know, until they're through this. Uh, I just saw, read an article about that today. Um, you know, if, if they're paying people's, you know, estimated wages or average wages, like whatever they were saying, they might, they might do something crazy, like do a loan product where it's like, we'll base it off of your unemployment income or whatever you're bringing in and still allow you to buy homes. Like, I, I don't know. It could be like some sort of HARP 3.0 or, or something. It's purely speculative. But, I mean, you're still going to have, you're still going to have the issue of like, people are going to deplete all of their reserves. So being in mortgage, I'm really jaded because the majority of people who buy homes put their, you know, entirety of their life savings into down payment on a home. They're buying, you know, 40, 50% of their debt to income ratio to buy a house. Um, their income disappears or one of their partner's income disappears. People are going to burn through their reserves trying to make their payments, uh, you know, even if they're on unemployment. And uh, I just don't think there's going to be, I don't think there's going to be that many people excited to jump in the market. Like we have, we have people actively, uh, canceling their pre-approval and I have to remind them you can't cancel a pre-approval you just that just means you're not buying a house but thanks for letting me know and uh, you know we have people who are trying to close their loans before they lose their jobs right now we've had we've had four borrowers lose their jobs just in the last week so it just I just I just think that the next six to 12 months is going to be so wild that like I, I just can't see people buying homes like in six months but I could be very wrong because at the same time, if you can't evict people and you can't foreclose on people and people have a place to stay for 12 months for free, they're also not going to cough up their home. So people who are like, oh, we're going to do short sales or we're going to do this, that's not a viable option. Why would I sell my house for, as a short sale and move out just so I can go get a monthly payment at an apartment when I can stay in the home I live in and not pay a, a payment for 12 months? So, so that's going to be a really good really market. The vision that I have in my head right now is like from the movie The Perfect Storm where they got battled around mm -hmm. a little bit, but right before they got sunk. Are you saying the, the safety is to cash, essentially? Go get yourself into cash now. There's going to be some confidence in the market right after we come out of this initial hit is what it feels like. And then after that, hold your horses. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm going to give a little plug to Mr. Gibson because, uh, you know, I thought about it and I was like, dude, this guy is poised to make some money here is, you know, when everybody. So if everybody is delayed 12 months from foreclosing, basically, you know, we get out 12 months from now, if 20 percent of people lose their jobs, how long is it going to take for the economy to rebuild those jobs? It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be years. 
And so all these people who have houses, big houses they bought, you know, are going to downsize and they're going to need storage. So like things like storage, mobile home parks, uh, you know, basically anything that has to do with like if you if you had to give up your home, uh, that that stuff's going to be in a really good position. I think I think on the same vein, like I'm a multifamily investor. I think that multifamily is going to do really good because. Uh, you know, people are just like in the financial collapse, you guys probably saw it. People moved to cities like crazy. I mean, Seattle's had a population growth explosion for 10 years straight. And uh, people are going to move to cities looking for work, particularly tech work, which was not really affected as much as the other sectors. And uh, I think that, you know, people are going to pour into housing here. They're going to, they're going to, you know, the other people are going to have to downsize their houses and rent, um, you know, some multifamily. Uh, you know, self-storage, just the regular asset classes are probably going to do, the regular income producing asset classes are probably going to do relatively fine. And, and then we're going to do even better in those asset classes because we're going to be able to negotiate terms for uh, materials, uh, subcontractors, bank financing that are so low that, you know, when, when things do turn around in two, three, four years, our costs to do capital improvements were so low, we're gonna our, our returns are gonna go through the roof. Wow. Yeah, and one thing I'll one thing I'll add to that is, you know, we have a four million unit shortage of housing in the United States for today. Right. And when people lose their jobs and can't pay, that housing shortage, it's gone. It evaporates immediately. So the two places that people are going to go live is in their, they're going to move back in with their parents. Well, maybe three places. They're going to move back in with their parents. They're going to live on the street or they're going to live in affordable housing. Yep. Right. right. Yeah. So well, I'm a little, I'm a little less bullish on multifamily depending on the type of multifamily, depending on the city, depending on where it is. It all this depends, but you know, you, if you don't have a job, you can't rent an apartment flat out. Where are you, so, uh, where are you looking and where are you avoiding? For multifamily? Yeah. We, we completely bailed from any multifamily residential in 2006. Okay. So we're, we stopped putting projects on our plate uh, for residential and we shifted into storage. Um, one of the reasons for that was we looked at the two asset classes that were performing the best during the last two recessions and it was storage and medical office. So we wanted to, we, we thought this, we thought the recession was going to be here like three years ago. Um, but now with medical office with so much, I mean, there's going to be a lot of commercial space that gets repurposed right now. There's just no, no yeah. way around that. So yeah, right. With medical office, I think that that is that going to be as stable, do you think? Because I think that's going to be constantly changing right now because a lot of this stuff, the cities are going to be like, well, screw it. Here you go. Yeah. This is the the whole Macy's or whatever it is is now a medical office. One one more thought about that medical office play. What's that, Augie? One more thought about that medical play is just uh, be aware uh, this, this coronavirus is impacting medical that is not uh, ICU and coronavirus driven. We have dentists, we have uh, other practitioners shutting down their right. businesses and laying off right. their medical staff. Uh, I would not necessarily be, I mean, Ryan's right. Like if it, if, it's, if it was a different type of recession, like I'd totally be all over medical. I think that you really have to be careful in any commercial asset space, particularly single tenant and a lot of the medical single tenant uh, I've heard multiple stories from our commercial lending partners that uh, their portfolio of multi-retail uh, assets have multiple people already not paying rent, and uh, you know it's going to take it's going to take some big cojones to pay those giant mortgage payments uh, while your tenants are are you know not active and trying to no, get yeah, these tenants would be very no, tough. Yeah, point taken. I mean that was that was mostly historical. Yes. Oh yeah. So it where is where are you? He kind of cut out. I didn't hear what he said. It, it, it's this is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it should be. I mean, it's crazy. 
Gibson, where are you, um, where are you maybe looking or what's on your like maybe watch list as far as markets right, coming in the next year or two? So we are, we are still full throttle with storage mm -hmm. and we are full throttle with storages that clip coupons um, from day one. And those are very, very high uh, in demand um, right now. So for example, we're buying two storages next week and they're both 90 plus percent occupied, occupied and they both cash flow from day one. Um, and, uh, you know, though that's, that's where the money's at. Um, you know, we're seeing the types of deals that you and I did together, Ridgemar mall, uh, which is a certificate of occupancy deal. Uh, we're seeing those start those types of deals where you're buying a storage business that's leasing up, that's not fully occupied. You're seeing a bigger discount in those deals. So to Augie's point, if I am right in 12 months and storage is the place to be, there are massive discounts on CFO deals. So um, they've gone up another, I think, uh, 50 basis points on the discount. So just to kind of summarize, when we, when we bought when we bought Ridgemar Mall storage, that was a C of O deal, it was empty. So what the way the market discounts that is they say, all right, when this thing is full and stabilized, it'll be worth this price at this cap rate. Well, you get a discount off of that stabilized cap rate when you buy it empty. So our whole play there is just to take it through lease up, have the cash reserves to take it through lease up. And when it's stabilized, you get a cheaper facility because you bought it with a risk of lease up, right? That, that uh, opportunity is growing right now. So people with CFO deals are further discounting those CFO deals because of the risk of what you're taking and the market has become greater. So that's what we're paying attention to. And then we're also ramping up our marketing on owners of existing storage businesses uh, to buy. Um, having said all that, I think what makes us unique and what makes us flexible is we have an army of private investors that we can go together with and take down these properties. And we're not relying on one investor. We've been preparing for this for five years, five plus years, you know, this opportunity to go in when liquidity is dried up, when there's fear in the marketplace and use a private investor network to buy these businesses uh, when other people can't get the funds to borrow or the funds to put down on a property. So markets, uh, we're sticking to our guns on market selection. Anybody is allowed to go, you know, anybody can see our markets uh, at spartanmap.com. Those are the markets that we look in. Uh, we're going to stick to those fundamentals on growth, population, storage rents, things like that. But we're, you know, we're, we think this is the best time to buy storage, to be honest, um, because it's, uh, it's, it's just, frankly, it's a good market. That's awesome. And yeah. are you doing any more mobile home stuff? Uh, that was just kind of a partnership with uh, a special group and a special project in SQUIM. So we don't really focus on that. We're just focused on, you know, storage for the most part, but um you know, this, the mobile home park and SQUIM, I mean, there's basically 10 projects like it in the country right now, um, you know, of that size being built, you know, to that scale. Um, so that was just kind of just a too unique of an opportunity to pass up. So we, we ended up doing that deal. And by the way, SQUIM now has a moratorium on building mobile home parks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we screwed it up. <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, well, I think we've, uh, we've, we've made it over, we made it over our hour allotted. Um, do you, uh, do you or anyone else have anything you want to maybe leave it with? And, uh, there is what's, what are you saying? I got one question. So, and this is to the group. So lots of million dollar houses here right now. We're all in agreement that they're not going to be million dollar houses. Well, as of a week ago, what do you think they go down to? Do you think they ever come back? And I, I ask it like that because when you layer on the demographics, yeah, we have population growth. Yeah, we have job creation. 
But when you lay on the demographics of the baby boomers, the average final age of disposition, I think, is 79. And baby boomers on the, on the tail end are 76. If this is a decade, you burn through half of the baby boomers. And on the front side, the millennials, they're going to be putting off household formation much longer than, I mean, they were just starting to form households. You know, I, my opinion on the Seattle, I'm, I'm very bullish on the Seattle market in general. Um, I mean, you, you look at you, I mean, I've been in different markets and I've seen, like, I lived in Washington DC for 10 years. I watched that market change for a variety of different reasons. And I thought, man, I'm never going to see a boom like this again in my life. And then I moved to Seattle and got to see it all over again. Um, you know, you look at Amazon, Amazon's about to throw down probably one of the best quarters of profit that they've ever had. And, right. if, and the reason is, is because nobody's flying anywhere. Nobody's going on the road. Nobody's staying in hotels. They're literally not spending any money and their sales are through the roof. I mean, you can't even prime now anything right now because it's all backed up. Uh, I mean, we were out for a walk in the neighborhood the last three days. The only thing going around the neighborhood is an Amazon van. I mean, right. it's, and, and think of how many people that employs in this area and it is the headquarters, right? And I just, I just think that there's so many, this is such an economically viable area that has jobs. I don't like, I think we're in this little, our own little bubble. We're on, we're, we're on a little backwater pond that will continue to just grow and expand because there's just no, I mean, I don't really think there's many markets out there like this market. I think it's a really good market. Now we be, we could become a victim of you know not being able to get loans and lending and things like that, but um, you know I just think that there's really strong market fundamentals here, um, you know to continue you know maybe there might be a dip for a while but at the end of the day this is where the jobs are. Well, on, the, on the loan side of it, what I see is you know, you don't have a lot of the same stuff that you had in 08. You don't have strippers with four houses that they bought zeroed <laughs> off, right? Like that. I mean that was a real thing in Vegas, right? Like, no. so, Right. Absolutely. And so you don't, you didn't, you didn't see that much irresponsibility, like just from, from an institutional standpoint, but now it was starting to get a little looser and, and then you have this pullback, but I mean, Seattle in, in itself is, is so landlocked too. It seems like that you're with the, the income that's there, the jobs that are there, and then the space, just the scarcity, I don't see that market getting affected like, you know, like the rest of. Well, what makes it even worse, Ryan, is the strippers don't even have jobs now. I know. I saw that. No, 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 no. Portland. Do you guys, do you guys see it? Heard the Portland thing? So no, no way. The strippers don't have jobs. Oh, well, right. I guess right now it's Corona. No, 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 no. So no, a strip club in Portland. I was, I was listening to my, my wife's radio station, some random thing. They're doing a thing called Boober eats. Right. And so they're like, right. you go on and you pay and there's a service charge and they have a security guy in the car and they have two girls come in. So it's a $30 service charge plus, plus they get, you know, you get tips or whatever. And I don't know. what. Augie, we can see your screen. I don't know what other services they they offer, but um, so just just so you know, and I, you know, and I think that might be um, that's a really good place to end it. I think probably too. Ryan, I, is, <laughs> is it is it is it thirty minutes or less, or it's free? Maybe, maybe. Augie, maybe. what are you finding? Can you share your screen? <laughs> <laughs> just I'm, you know, I I couldn't make that up. I'm not I'm not creative enough. Oh, your phone's still muted. Oh, I can. Uh, don't worry. I was just sending an invoice to y'all. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> well, it was good seeing you guys. Yeah, thanks for your awesome. time. Thank you yeah, so much, thanks. Ryan. All right, guys. Thanks for thanks for coming, especially you guys that are way up north and never come down and drink beer with us. Yeah, that was a good reason to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you, Bye. Thank you.